This is Stephen E. Arnold. Dark Cyber 2022 is our fourth series of videos about online access related to online, smart software, and Intelware. Smart software, sometimes called artificial intelligence or machine learning, pivots on statistical methods. With me today is Donna M. Ingram, who has a PhD in economics from Cornell University and an undergraduate degree in mathematics from Goucher College, which is recognized as one of the most innovative institutions in the United States. In addition to teaching, she has served as a consultant to various organizations. Her statistical projects have included finance, manufacturing, and subrogation. She's worked on a number of activities with my research team. Donna, thank you for agreeing to talk with me about your new book, Help Me Learn Statistics. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Why do we need another book about statistical procedures and methods? I think a lot of people view statistics as magic. Many people distrust it saying that statistics lie. Others trust it implicitly. Neither position is good. We are all constantly bombarded by statistics. My goal is to help people become better informed and better consumers of statistics. Many students learn rules regarding statistical tests churned out by computer, but don't seem to understand the logic behind the rules. I wanted to pull back the curtain and show the logic. What did you do in your book to try to make the concepts and methods come alive for the reader? The book is filled with sample problems, a lot of examples, because I think that's how most of us learn, and a lot of practice problems. Most books have problems at the back of the chapter that become homework problems, but I put a lot of practice problems in each chapter. For each example, I follow that up with a practice problem where I hide the answer to the practice problem. I was able to use some technology so that there's buttons that students can click and see the answer and how the problem is solved. Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, tackled the misapplication of numerical methods. Why do you think her approach has not gained more traction? I think she unveils a high-tech version of a very old problem. Whether we examine the motives of the company devising the method or the group applying it, their goal is often what is good for them. The voice of a small group that holds some power is often very loud. Using her examples, this would be the voice of businesses, including banks and insurance companies. Small groups are more easily organized into one voice. This is especially true with businesses because they are often already members of a group. Large groups, those who are harmed by some of the practices, are more difficult to organize. This problem is made worse because the processes are opaque and the people being harmed aren't necessarily aware of it. For me, setting the baseline seems quite important. You write clearly about testing. Do you think that testing can lead to shaping or steering the study findings? Absolutely. There is definite concern when building a statistical model that the model is created to conform to the data. This can bias the results because the data is a random sample and may not accurately represent the population, the actual real world situation. I was taught to take a subset of the data, use it when creating the model, and test the accuracy of the model using another subset of the data. For example, if I'm using regression, I build the model using a subset of the data. I then use those results to predict the values of the dependent variable and calculate the errors. If the errors are similar to what I found when I was originally building the model, I feel reasonably confident that the model describes the relationship between the independent and dependent variables well. In order to further test the model, I'd like my clients to apply my results to data that I have no access to. For example, I might ask for data from 2020. I would subset the data, build and test a model using that data. 
I would then give the results from that model to my client and ask them to apply it to their 2021 data. This lets them see whether the insights from my analysis would have benefited them. It leads to a few sleepless nights for me while I wait for the results, but I'm essentially letting them test my product before they use it. In your experience, what are the risks of shaping algorithms to reach a predetermined result? I think a lot of times people are rewarded for reaching a specific conclusion. Personally, I would rather be right than have to reach a specific conclusion. Part of why I test my results the way I do is because I don't want to be proven wrong later on down the road. I think that people will grasp at any conclusion, whether it's right or wrong, because that's how our reward system is set up. I may have mentioned to you that I worked with a PhD in mathematics who lived and died by regression analysis. This was his pet method. I want to know what steps are needed to ensure that a pet method does not affect the study results. I want an objective result, not a trained dog act. I think we probably all have our favorite methods, the methods that we use day in and day out for the type of problem that we study. First of all, I think it's important to recognize that even though it might be our pet method, it doesn't apply everywhere. And there are some branches of statistics that just aren't our strong suit. I don't think there are many people who are willing to admit that, however. In terms of recognizing when there might be bias, I think follow the money has always been good advice. We have to look for the motive behind the analysis. The trouble is that now it can be a little more difficult to find the motive Recently, the misuse of chi-square testing has surfaced as one of the more common manipulations in some falsified but peer-reviewed research papers. The results are non-reproducible. What is the preferred way to use a test like chi-square or some similar procedure to make sure a method is valid? Chi-square tests appear when we're working with a squared standard normal distribution. We know that given enough data, sample means will tend to be normally distributed. I don't know of a result that guarantees when we can use chi-squared. Whether chi-squared is being used to test the variance, goodness of fit, or independence, I think it's good to test on subsets to see if the results are consistent. Much as I described before, you take part of the data, run the test, take another section of the data, run the same test and see whether you get similar results. If you get similar results, that gives me more confidence in the results. It's also often possible to verify the results using a different method such as logistic regression. Personally, I like to see if the results are robust with respect to the method used. If, it, if I'm able to use more than one method to analyze data, I analyze it every way I can and see whether the results. Francis Hagen, the Harvard graduate and former Facebook professional, has released some confidential statistical data. The documents I saw struck me as an example of ignoring what the data said or shaping the data. How common is this type of behavior in large organizations? The optimist in me wants to believe that it isn't that common but I suspect it really is fairly common because I believe that people are rewarded for finding evidence of the right answer, the answer that their company, that their employer wants them to find. I have been in situations before where I've been told what my results should be. I don't do that. Um, and I think a lot of people don't do that. I hope a lot of people don't do that, but there is an incentive to do that. I would rather have a good reputation and have someone angry with me because I found the wrong answer, but I'm not sure a lot of people feel that way. 
I think that's why you fit in so well with my team's approach. I'm not the least bit interested in being paid so someone can tell us what the results of a study should be. What's very refreshing was your discussion of sampling and testing. But some researchers are pushing aggressively for the use of synthetic data, which are data cooked up by combining information from different sources or using algorithms to generate data. What's the risk of using synthetic data versus the real life data, which are often messy and expensive to validate and normalize? Synthetic data is often computer generated and designed to mimic actual data. It can be useful because if we don't have that much data, it can be difficult to subset the data, as I've talked about, and test results. The trouble is that synthetic data is generated using descriptive statistics that come from actual data. Those descriptive statistics are somewhat random because we can have not necessarily errors in data, but data is random. It, it, it's not necessarily reproducible all the time, which means that the data that we generate, however much we do, might be incorrect. I've used synthetic data that I've generated by simulating business processes using descriptive statistics that came from interviews with individuals involved in the real life process. Personally, I think it's important to look at the results when we use synthetic data and see whether they're consistent with what we observe in real life. When I've used synthetic data from simulations, I go back to the people involved in the process and say, do these results look realistic? We worked on what I thought was a very interesting project. You made a very compelling argument to me to use a method that depended on survivability algorithms. Basically, we pulled math procedures from cancer research and applied them to insurance fraud. Our work yielded remarkable insights, but the client was reluctant to abandon manual seat-of-the-pants methods, ignoring a high-value numeric method. I think it's natural to be reluctant to use something that we might not completely understand. In 2020 hindsight, this showed that leadership was very risk-averse and was willing to pursue almost any lead, no matter how unlikely it was to be productive and no matter how much it cost. Have you encountered other examples of clients refusing the facts of research analysis? Absolutely. And one of the things that I have learned along the way is that I really have to pay attention to the personality of the organization and how much change they're willing to accept. The last chapter in your new book is called Next Steps. I want to put you on the spot and ask, what's your next step? I'm always more than willing to take on interesting consulting work, as I suspect you are. I'm also writing a book on probability. Um, probability is something of a prequel to the statistics book, since statistical methods are developed using probability theory. If someone wants to purchase a copy of your new book, where is it available? It's only available electronically. That is because I wanted to use the technology for the practice questions in there. It is available through the Apple Bookstore, or you can go to my website, which is DonnaMIngramPhD.com, and I have links there to the Apple Bookstore. If someone wants to tap your expertise, what's the preferred way to contact you? I think the easiest way to find me is to go to my website, DonnaMIngramPhD, and if they don't find that link, I suspect they could go to you and you would put us in contact. Absolutely. I've enjoyed our conversation and I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me. For more dark cyber news and information, read Beyond Search, our free weblog about online services and sources. This is Stephen E. Arnold logging off. Wow, wow, wow.